if you turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, I will be putting the verses up there. I'm going to talk and preach this morning on a message I entitled Detours, all right, or the cure for shaken faith. And really, uh, the idea of doing this came, i uh, been looking at the episodes of the third season of Chosen. Anybody watch that beside me? All right. I, I think tremendous, right? And uh, one of the last episodes, I don't know if it's the last episode, was when Jairus' daughter was healed, and then the woman along the way with the issue of blood that she was healed. All right, so this is what we're going to be talking about this morning. All right, detours. Now, before I get into the message, let me sort of frame it, give you a little story. Now, in my life, this is going to happen before GPS. I'm old enough, man, I... You know, there was no GPS when I was raising my kids, right? There were atlases. And Diane gave me a new one like every year in the back of my car would have multiple atlases. I had maps of every state where we were in, all right? Now, I remember uh, this experience. In fact, it happened more than once, all right? You get the trip all planned out. Back that day, we planned out what that meant is that you had the car wash. You had the car full of gas. You had everything checked out. You had the AAA membership, you called them, you got the, what they call, if I'm right, the trip tick, right? And I had it down exactly what rows to take, how to go, all right? Not willing to trust them completely, I had all the atlases in the back, Diane's in the seat, kids in the back, all right? If anything would happen, Diane's going to pull up those atlases, all right? And uh, we would leave early, all right? You're going to leave early, 5 in the morning, 4 in the morning, because you want to miss what? Traffic, all right, where you're going, whether Florida, whatever. You get on the road, you're making great time. I mean, you say, man, this is better than whatever I expected. Then all of a sudden on 95, a flashing light. Road closed. What do you mean road closed? This is interstate, you know, 95. Detour ahead. Now, Bill, like a... Any man back in, well, maybe most men back at that time, my panic went into full gear. Oh, wait a minute. This is not what I planned. How am I going to know where to go? If I get off the road, we're going to get lost. When I become panicked, of course, Diane, she's going to become panicked with me because her responsibility was to get all those maps and the atlas and know exactly where I'm going so I would not get lost. Of course, again, like most men, all right, my creed is you never ask anybody for directions. You rely upon yourself, all right? And so uh, the, you end up, then plan on the, the detour. I mean, you start, end up panicking. And uh, started out, you know, like, <laughs> you know, full faith, I'm going to get there. And all of a sudden that happens. Life is that way, all right? At least it is for me. You start out full of faith, man, you know, Especially when I was listening to somebody was talking about young people. You know exactly where you're going. Man, you got the plan. You know the destination. You know what's going to happen. And you start out, but then what? Something happens, right? Unexpected, you get that detour. And you panic, and you lose faith, all right, many times. And that's the way life is, I think, even for us as believers. We know in our minds... All right, how life should unfold, at least our lives, right? And what God should do for us, what his plan should be. And we feel good as long as, you know, he's sitting on the seat beside us. He ends up saying we're going in the right direction, no problems. But when those detours come, it seems like we lose our faith. Now, let me say before I, you know, preach this morning, I do not believe for a believer in lost faith, all right? I believe in eternal security of a believer. I believe once you're birthed into the family of God, you are in the family of God. I believe that Jesus finished the work for our salvation. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 says, This is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. It is not something we earned. It is not something we deserve. It is given by God. It is a gift of God. Acts 10, 43, uh, to him uh, all the prophets witness that through his name, all right, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. 
as I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior, my sins are forgiven, all right? And I'm birthed into the family of God. And praise God, I can be saved and I can be safe. John uh, chapter 10, verse 29, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. See, I don't have to worry about my eternal security because my eternal security is not based upon what Bill does. It is based upon what my Savior did, and I am in his hand, and it's not about my faithfulness, but it is about his eternal uh, faithfulness. So I believe, in other words, we don't lose our faith, but I do believe our faith can be shaken. All right? I do believe that. You may not lose your faith, but you can experience shaken faith. Your faith may not be what it once was. Something happens. Some unexplained detour in your life. Uh, it could be a friendship that soured. It could be a financial setback. It could be all of a sudden the boss comes in and says, I need to see you, and you lose your job. It can be financial problems, be health problems. It could be a death of a loved one. But something has happened, and your faith is shaken. Now, in Mark chapter 5, you find the story really, of shaken faith, all right? And you find its cure. So Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 43. I'm not going to read all the verses, but let me give you the story before I, you know, give you the truths that I want to give you this morning. Jesus has now crossed over the Sea of Galilee, and he's back in Capernaum. And a great multitude has gathered because they've heard all the miracles that Jesus has performed. In the midst of all this going on, there's a nobleman. All right, whose daughter is very sick to the point of death. And he approaches the Lord at this time. And if you look at verse 23, he says, My little girl is at the point of death. Please come and just lay your hands on her that she may be healed and live. So he comes to the Lord. He has a tremendous need. This little girl, he loves with all his heart. And what we see here evidently is his only child would you come and heal her? And Jesus says, really, basically, let's go. In fact, that next verse in verse 24 is that Jesus went with him. And I was thinking about this. Isn't it great in life when you get God going in the right direction? And you know what direction that is, right? My direction, right? And when he, I mean, it does something for your faith, the way you want him to go. And Jairus' faith is now strengthened, all right? And it's funny how this works, right? That my faith is a lot stronger when God goes the direction I want him to go. But when he veers off my plan and my path, that's when I have problems with faith. But all of a sudden, all right, they're making the way to Jairus' house. And all of a sudden, Jesus is sidetracked. There's a detour along the way. Everything is going great. I mean, Jerry, my girl's going to be healed. But then something happens. Here comes this woman, all right, in verse 25. If you look in uh, Mark uh, chapter 5. And it ends up a certain woman, it says in that verse, had a flow of blood for 12 years. She's been sick for 12 years, all right? And uh, she ends up... Uh, coming, all right, on the scene. And she has this issue of blood. Everybody knows her, uh, evidently. She spent everything she had, in verse 26 you read about, going to every doctor that there was, but nobody was able to heal her. And she needs to get to Jesus because she believes, if I can just get to him, he could take care of this. All of a sudden, there's hope that's birthed within her heart. But Jesus is en route to Jairus' house. It's an urgent matter. His daughter is dying, could die at any moment. And this woman is believing, if I could just touch, you know, the hem of his garment, that I believe by faith that I would be healed. Well, God gives the woman this idea. Just weave your way through the crowd, get down low, reach out, and touch him with 
just touched the hem of his garment. She believes, verse 27 and 28, if I would just touch his clothes, that I would be healed. Well, she does. And in verse 29, you read this. It says, immediately the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. She's healed. And uh, you got to remember, Jairus, uh, the one thing in his brain is to get Jesus to his house. Jesus then turns around and he says this strange statement, at least it was strange to uh, the disciples who were with him, who touched me? And I think the Chosen did a great job with this because Jesus is literally surrounded by a mass of people. And all of a sudden he turns around and he goes, who touched me? You know, the disciple, what do you mean who touched you? I mean, I mean, everybody's trying to touch you. All right? The disciples were confused. You see, this is verse 31. But this was a special touch. And I was thinking about that. You know, there's a touch and then there's a touch. Am I right? It's just like there's a prayer and then there's a prayer. All right? And Jesus tells this woman, as turns around, she acknowledges that it was her. Verse 34, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of this affliction. Man, she is celebrating. Something that she's been dealing with for 12 years and now is completely healed. Now, I want you to think about it a second about Jarius. What does all this do for him? Is he really focused on this woman, excited that she's healed? Is he happy that the procession has stopped? Now, remember, his daughter is dying now. Now. This woman has been sick for how many years? Twelve years. Am I right? Uh, if he would be thinking like I'd be thinking, a few more hours... A few more days wouldn't even matter, right? You've been, you've been sick 12 years. My daughter is dying now. Jesus needs to do this now. He needs to come to my house now. What would you do? Think about this. If you were in Jairus' place and Jesus was on the way to your house and your daughter was the point of death, wouldn't you be saying, you need to wait? <laughs> he, has, uh, he has a prior appointment at my house. And before they can resume the journey, news comes from Jairus' house, verse 35. Look at this. While he was still speaking, while Jesus is speaking, and he is taking this time, tells this woman, your faith has healed you, all right? Some came from the roar of the synagogue's house, all right, and said, your daughter is now dead. Why bother? Why trouble the teacher any further? Doesn't need to come to the house. Your daughter has died. Jesus notices what's going on because this is happening very, very quickly. Because you've got to figure what's going on in Jairus' mind and his spirit. A man who was filled with hope. I mean, we're, we're on the road. We're on the path. Jesus will come to my house. My daughter is going to be healed. My prayers are answered. All of a sudden, this woman dis disrupts, all right, the journey. And now my daughter is dead. And his faith is shaken. In fact, he has almost lost his faith. And Jesus, at that exact moment, you got to remember, at the exact moment, he speaks into his ear in the midst of all these people. As soon as Jesus heard that word that was spoken, as soon as he heard that they're telling this man, your daughter's dead, he speaks into the ear of that leader, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. You know what I'm thankful for? That God's word always arrives at the exact moment we need it. How many times when we're in a situation like this that all hope seems to be dashed, our faith is shaking, and it's that still small voice of God's Spirit within us that speaks, just believe, just believe. That's what's happening. And Jairus, it's almost Jesus saying, 
when you started the journey, you believed. It says, I've stopped for this woman, but I have not forgotten you. See, sometimes in life, at least I'm this way, that when things don't go the way that I wish they would be going and something happens in my life, it's all of a sudden Satan plants a thought in my mind that God's forgotten me because he has another agenda doing something else that he's forgotten me. But do you understand when he stopped and he's dealing with this woman, he still has not forgotten Jarius. He has still not forgotten her need. And understand, even in our lives, I mean, God's family is big. And it's amazing. He can be ministering to one, but understand, he has not forgotten you. You are still on his heart. You're still on his mind. When they arrive at the house, the mourners are everywhere, weeping and wailing. Jairus doesn't know what's going on. All right, the daughter's dead. There is no hope. Jesus says, believe. And Jesus heard their unbelief. Verse 39, he ends up saying when he came to the house, he said to them, why are you making all this commotion, all this weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And he ends up telling him, get this crowd out of the house. I mean, they mock him. What do you mean sleeping? He's, she's dead. All right? Unbelievers will never experience the miraculous. That's reserved for the believing child of God, all right? And when they are gone, Jesus takes the child by the hand. And you look in verse 41. Jairus says, they, just picture yourself. I just picture myself. because I Seven kids. You know, and I picture this girl, a small girl. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Tavla Kumai, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately she arose. And he tells them to get her something to eat. And you read at the end of that chapter, verse 42, Meet the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. Whew. What a great miracle. Man shaken, faith restored. You know, when I was looking, here's the three thoughts that I had, all right? See, in my life, and I believe in all lives as God's children, here's truth number one. Along life's pathway... Detours will come to you. You can just mark it down. And in these times of detour, your faith will be shaken. All right? There's going to be times that life is not going to go as you wished it would. Life's not going to proceed as how you planned it, whether it's in your life, your children's life, financial life, job situation. Things are not going to go all the time according to your plan. And at those times, tendency is for our faith to be shaken. You see it throughout the Word of God. Let me give you some examples. Abraham is called the what? Father of the faithful. All right? Abraham, if you know the story, follows God to the land of promise. God came to him, appeared to him, said, leave the, your homeland, the Ur of the Chaldees, go to a place that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. You'll be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. All right? And uh, remember, he's 75 years of age when God appears to him. And he was told that a son's going to be born to you in your old age. And through him, you're, a great nation is going to come. And Abraham chooses to believe God and steps out by faith to a place he has never seen, believing God to be true to his promise. But he goes to that land, and as soon as he was there, what ends up happening Detour. I mean, you think if God's telling you to go somewhere, he's going to provide for you. But you read in Genesis chapter 12, there was a famine, verse 10, in the land. Immediately goes there. Instead of being this land that's going to be able to minister to his knees, there's a famine. And immediately Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, of course, he says to Sarah, his wife, indeed, I know that you're a woman of a beautiful countenance. Therefore, will happen when Egyptians see you, they will say, this is my wife, and they'll kill me, but let you live. Please, dear, say that you're my sister. All right? You end up seeing Abraham. All right? He has faith in God. He goes to the promised land. 
He's expecting that God is going to bless him in that land. And immediately what happens? There's a famine. How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to take care of myself? In other words, what is going to happen? So he takes his life in his own hands. His faith was shaken. Now you keep on reading about Abraham. Abraham comes back to the land out of Egypt. He's now in his mid-80s. He still doesn't have a child. Usually when you're in mid-80s, you're not looking to start a family. All right? But Abraham is still looking for that child. Years pass, no son. Instead of believing, if you read in Genesis chapter 16, what does he do? He listens to Sarah and comes with his plan. We'll have a son by my wife's handmaiden. All right? We'll help God out. All right? Since he doesn't get on plan A, all right, we're going to give him a plan B, and uh, we'll help him out. But his faith was shaken because he did not believe what? That he could have a son. A man of faith, but yet it seemed like when detours came, that how he thought things were going to unfold in his life did not happen, his faith is shaken. How about Moses, the great lawgiver, deliverer of Israel? Remember, he follows God, God appeared to him in the desert when he was 80 years of age. So I'm going to send you back to Egypt. You're going to deliver my people. Or I'm going to use you to deliver my people, all right, uh, from under Pharaoh. He's 80 years of age. He didn't want to go. He tried everything to convince God, send somebody else, anybody but me. So he finally says, I'll go, all right? And he believes that God is going to use him to deliver the people. And he figures if he's going to go, God's going to work. And Pharaoh will release the people. But you remember when he stands before Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, who's this God that I would release these people? And instead of letting them go, he doubles down, all right, Pharaoh, on the labors that they had to do. Things get worse. So God's sending Moses to Egypt to deliver the people. But when he goes where God wants him to go, says what? God wants him to say, things get worse. That doesn't compute, does it? I'm sent there to deliver the people, but yet you are making, right, the labors of the people even harder. And you read his prayer in uh, Exodus chapter 5. Listen to what he says in verse 22. He says, so Moses turned to the Lord praying, Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your people? Why have you sent me? Why in the world did you send me to Egypt if you're not going to deliver them? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. It's, his faith is shaken. He doesn't understand what's going on. You look at John the Baptist. I mean, first cousin of Jesus. They were only six months apart. They knew each other most of their lives. Jesus described him. As uh, those born a woman, there is not one who is greater. He was a forerunner to the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. Instead of seeing God's kingdom, he sees the walls of a prison. Herod has him in prison. And he ends up sending word to Jesus through some of his apostles. And this is exactly what he says, are you the Messiah? Or should I look for somebody else? You're talking about John the Baptist. Jesus says, greatest born among women, forerunner of Christ, great preacher. He's in a prison cell, and he's asking Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Are you really the one? His faith was what? Shaken. Look at Peter, the rock. Remember Peter, right? Look at all those disciples. Every one of these guys, they'll let you down. But you look at Big Pete, he'll never let you down. I'll be there when everybody leaves you. We know how that worked out, right? He denied him three times, all right? And it ends up that faith that was so strong, kind of misguided. But at the time of crisis, what does he say? I do not know the man. And you remember, this is the same Peter God's going to use to preach on the day of Pentecost and everything else. And then you have here Jarius, right? He hears the word that the Lord's going to come 
but then the detour. And what I'm saying to you, even it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. And I'm talking to those that are Christians that we believe in God, trust in his word. Times are going to come in your life when there's detours going to come. And you're not going to understand what God's doing. You're going to be confused. You're going to be bewildered. And there's times your faith is going to shake. You're going to want, what's happening? Can I trust God? Can I continue to live for him? So understand, don't be surprised when those detours come. But here's the second truth, all right? Detours will not always, you know, detours will come in this year that we're facing. But the second truth, during these times of shaken faith, these detours, our God does not forget us and our God does not forsake us. See, again, I have this thing in my life when everything is going Bill's way. I feel good, man. Things are going well with the family. You just feel God's there. God's blessed me. And God has blessed me. But when your world starts to fall apart, then you start these questions, is God still there? And what I'm saying, during these times of detour, shaken faith, God does not forget you and God does not forsake you. He knows what you need to hear, and he knows when you need to hear it. Remember Abraham, when he was wondering, here I am, you know, in my mid-80s. We still don't have a child. And it ends up at that time, if you read in Genesis chapter 17, God ends up coming to him. It's amazing. God knows the exact time when to come. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talks to him and says, uh, he ends up saying, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father, I have made you. He doesn't have a child yet, you understand? But God says, what I declare by my word will come to pass, because it's not in your strength, but it is not my almighty power. He ends up saying, I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make the nations of you, and kings shall come from you. God speaks faith into his heart. Remember Moses? Couldn't understand what God was doing. God ends up appearing to him. After this, you can read in Exodus chapter 6, and the Lord says to Moses, Now you'll see what I will go and do to Pharaoh. For the strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. And God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I am the God. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I established my covenant with them to give them land of Cana, land of pilgrimage. And he ends up telling them they will inherit that land. He comes to Moses at the time when his faith was shaken. The John the Baptist, in fact, you saw this if you looked at the Chosen. John sends the messengers, his disciples, to Jesus. Are you really the Messiah? Did we look for another? And Jesus says, just stand right there and look. And go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. And those men went back, and John's faith was rekindled in the Lord. To Peter, along the shore of Galilee, you remember Peter, after the resurrection, he had denied the Lord three times. He goes back fishing. You talk of a man with regrets. Am I right? He's the man that said, I'll never forsake you. Three times he declared, I do not know the man. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears on the shore. They recognize him. And you remember, Peter comes to the shore. What were the words that Jesus said to Peter? Come and dine. Come and have breakfast with me. See, what Peter was thinking, the Lord was done with him. And rightfully, he could have been. Am I right? But it ends up, we know that you only invite people that you love, you care for, into your place to feed them. Jesus, come. Have, let me cook breakfast. He cooked breakfast for him. What do you think that did to Peter? He needed that. The Lord hadn't written him off. The Jairus, he comes at that moment when his faith is shaking and says, don't be afraid, only believe. What I'm saying this morning is no matter where the path of life takes you or has brought you, understand you are not forgotten of God. He is there. 
Hebrews 13, 5, for he himself has said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 8, the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Do not fear. And I'm saying this morning, understand, detours are going to come. We're not going to understand what's happened. We tend to see the panic loose, to end up have our face shaken. But understand, during these times, God has not forgotten you. Just because it seems silent. It seems like, you know, when nothing happens. I do, at least maybe, I, maybe most men are like me. I do good when I'm busy. I got to be doing something. I got to be involved in something. If I have too much quiet, not doing, I get in trouble. All right? I get in real trouble. And I'm, even as Christians, when it seems like God has me a holding pattern, I struggle, holding pattern, I struggle more with my faith. All right? Because I want what's going on. In other words, we need to get going, right? And it ends up, I'm under, I want to say that even the detours of life, when it seems like God has a stop, and we're making no headway, right? God hasn't forgotten us. God knows exactly what he's doing. And the third truth, God's going to be faithful to his promises. God will be faithful to his promises. He was faithful to Abraham. I'm not going to time read all these verses. But you understand when you read uh, in Genesis 21, a son was born. By the way, how old was Abraham? 100 years of age. You understand, God gave him the promise of a son when he was 25. I mean, excuse me, not 20. Gave him the promise of when he was 75. It was 25 years. Think about a detour for 25 years. Think about God making you a promise you're going to have a son, and then everything stops for 25 years. See, my brain would be, all right, I'm already 75. God promised me a son. That means the wife is going to be expecting, all right, later on this year. I mean, does that, does that compute with anybody here? Not 25 years later, right? Detour, to, but the son was born. Why? So that Abraham would know it was by God and God alone. You look at Moses. He was faithful to Moses. Read in Exodus chapter 14. He leads the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is destroyed. In other words, Moses saw this. He was faithful to John. He said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Didn't John have his head cut off? Yeah, he did. But he was faithful to him. Where's John now? In the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John eleven twenty five. Remember what Jesus said? I'm the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me. Though he may die, yet shall he, what, live? 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. John the Baptist is alive and doing well. God was faithful to him. He was faithful to Peter. Whew. Read about his message. On the day. Here's a man who denied Jesus three times, gets up to preach on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 men get saved. Whoa. God used him in a tremendous, tremendous way. And by the way, he was faithful to Jairus, wasn't he? He goes to the house of a dead girl, all hope gone, and the girl comes to life. And what I'm saying this morning, he'll be faithful to you. He will keep his promise. It won't be on your timetable or my timetable, but he will be faithful. He will keep his word. Philippians 1, 6, be confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a great work in you will perfect it on the day of Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 18, For surely I say to you, to heaven and earth shall pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle shall by any means pass from my law to all be fulfilled. You know, detours come, but the cure, you just keep on believing, keep on trusting God. We're almost out of time. Let me, let me add this. Another personal experience. I remember I went back to school later in life to finish training to be a pastor. I was in the finance world and uh, went back to school. Ended up finishing my college. In other words, um, and I'm saying this to lift myself up, with, in two years and graduated the top in the class and all that and everything, all right? My plan was that I was a lay pastor before then that I'd be a pastor of a church. 
and would um, end up um, wherever that would be. In other words, uh, before I was a lay pastor in Illinois, I went down to a school called Tennessee Temple. And then my plan was, all right, here you are, Billy, grad top in the class, ended up preaching at Highland Park Baptist Church, 5,000 members in the church, ended up preaching. And I said, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a pastor, all right? I was working at a hotel at that time, seven nights a week, all right? So I'm ready, all these offers to come in, right? All these people. I have all these classmates, all right, who didn't do anywhere near what I was going. Oh, I'm going here. I'm going there. Bill's still working at the hotel, cleaning bathrooms, all right? Suitable. Nothing. Nothing. I go, wait a minute here. Plan was I left the job, left all this, prepare myself to be a pastor, all right? Lord, do I remind you, I left everything. I drug my whole family, all right? from Springfield, Illinois, down to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I mean, weeks, months pass. I finally go see Dr. Lee Robinson, who was the chancellor of the school. And I said, you know, <laughs> I'm a little confused. He said, I have something for you, Bill. Oh, okay, what? you can be a children's worker. Wait a minute. I was a pastor before I went to school, graduated top in the class, and now I'm going to be a a children's work. And I certainly, you go and you see maybe that's God's will. I couldn't say no to him, all right, if you knew who he was. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly where God wanted me to be. And through there, I ended up starting a church down in that area and then ended up going to a, really a ministry of God uses greatly in New York City. But it was a big detour. I didn't understand what was going on in my life. I mean, I, did, I thought I did everything God wanted me to do, and I'm just sitting there and seeing God do other things for other people. And I'm, my faith was shaken. I was confused. All right, what was going to happen? But can I say now, like I'm 70, God was faithful. He didn't forget me. See, sometimes we don't know what God's doing. Sometimes he's preparing something better for you than you even understand. We want immediate gratification, right? We want some, God to do something right now. Maybe he's preparing something better for you. So what I'm saying, no matter what has happened in your life now or goes this year, you, you might end up being confused, Detroit, faith is shaken. But great men and women have had shaken faith. But what you do in the midst of that, I'm going to still trust God. God hasn't forgotten me. God's going to be true to his word. God's going to be faithful. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're in the midst of something in your own life that your faith is shaken. That you had, you know, you thought you had a plan. You thought things were going to go a certain way. Might be with your kids. Might be with marriage. It might be with finances. Might be with a job. It might be with ministry. I don't know what it is. But it seems like that you're in the midst of a big detour. I mean, it's like, it's, you don't know what's happening. And your faith is shaken. What I'm telling you this morning, that's not a sin. I'm telling you this morning, in the midst of shaken faith, you look to the God of your faith. And you understand he has a word for you, and he will be faithful to his promises. Maybe this morning you just need to come to this altar, bow your knee, and say, Lord, not my will, but your being done. Not my plan, but your plan. I submit to you. I will trust you in whatever you have for my life. That's the greatest act of worship there is. Yielding your life a living sacrifice to him. I'm going to ask for everyone to stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. It's our practice here at the church that we have a time of invitation at the end of the service that you would respond to the Word of God. Maybe you need to come this morning and bow in the midst of shaken faith and say, Lord, I choose this morning, I'm going to trust you in the midst of everything that's going on in my life. And I'm going to believe in you. We invite you to come.